before the break, living in Ireland today, unobtrusively and mostly ignored by the greater Irish public, are the descendants of Ireland's former ruling ascendancy. But by virtue of history, they are, despite their ancestry, regarded as being less Irish than the rest of us, somehow not of Ireland. Well, talking to present-day Irish chiefs and peers who live and work in the Republic, author Anne Chambers traces the historical and political evolution of this silent division in a fascinating and engaging new book at arm's length. You're very welcome to us, um, Anne, this morning. Since uh, uh, Britain and Ireland separated, since independence, there's been a huge gulf between uh, ordinary Irish folk, as it were, and the aristocracy here. Yeah, that's something that fascinated me. Um, and that really was the whole basis for the book, because I always felt that I thought it was myself, you know, that, uh, that this divide existed between the rest of the Irish public and the descendants of the former ascendancy. Uh, and I wanted to know, was that fact or was it just my imagination? So that set me off on the trail of this book. And Anne, it, it, it's more to do with our history and the politics in this country as opposed to um, the division, say, between wealth and status. Exactly. It is more to do with politics and history. And when you look at the other republics in Europe, you see that perhaps material things is the difference between their aristocracy and the rest of the people. But here in Ireland it runs deeper than that. The seeds really for that division were sown almost as soon as the Normans set foot in the country. And I trace that in the book. But what makes it more interesting from my perspective is how the present day descendants of the Normans, of the Cromwellians, of the Elizabethans that are with us today, how in turn they have been, if you like, kept at arm's length now since the foundation of the state. And actually some of them can really be left feel like they are strangers in their own country. We have two aristocracies, in, in, don't we, Anne? We have, we have the ancient Irish or the Bren aristocracy, and then we have, I suppose, the Anglo-Irish or the Anglo-Norman or, a, you know, the, so, so, uh, which one were you concentrating on specifically and which one have we forgotten most? We've forgotten both. I mean, you talk to somebody like Conor O'Brien, Lord Inch Quinn, who is the 32nd great-grandson in descent from Brian Baru, but he also has an English title or an English given title. And he could tell me, and indeed he gave me the title for the book at arm's length, he felt he was, as his family had been kept at arm's length by the state. How could a descendant of Brian Baru feel less Irish than any of the rest of us. He, he's made that feel that, yes. Now, here, here am I with a name called Chambers, but by virtue of my accent, my birth, and my education, I would be looked on today as nothing other than Irish. But somebody like, for example, Conor O'Brien, 32nd great-grandson of Brian Baru, because of the past allegiance maybe of his family, past historical events in his family that really have nothing to do with him, but today he can still feel a little bit removed from the country to which he belongs and by virtue of his birth perhaps belongs more than any of us. But I have to say at the same time, I interviewed 14 of the descendants of the ascendancy as they are living and working in the Republic today and they are quite a bunch I must say and very very interesting and they're all very very positive and I think that's what the greater Irish public don't realise that these people are there, they're doing their, their work, they're contributing in a significant way to the making of this new modern Irish state. And they are and have become actually in a funny turnaround as we become almost more anglicised, the rest of the Irish public, mm. they have really zoomed back into their Irishness which is, I found, quite a significant, you know, development, really. Lord, Lord Henry Mount Charles, um, Anne, is probably the best known, or one of the best yes. known uh, uh, aristocrats in the country. Mm, well, when you enter the pop world and politics <laughs> at the same time, that's guaranteed. Yes, Henry would be, and I think he, in the book, he is quite, I suppose, forthright, as he tends always to be, and I found his attitude indeed and his contribution it nearly rocked me in its awful truthfulness you know today we're so used to sound bites and really being deceived I suppose by so many uh, icons that we held in such pedestals and it was lovely and refreshing indeed to talk to somebody who really told it as it was and didn't pull a punch and I think that is reflected in his contribution to the book who else do we have uh, sorry Mark 
No, go ahead. Well, we have the 13th great grandson of Grand Whale, who is uh, uh, one Lord of Altamont. the ladies who tends to accompany me on my journey through life, and that's Lord Altamont in Westport House. And his contribution was very interesting as well, because he was talking about the economic development of the West of Ireland, so he was talking very much as a West of Ireland man. Uh, and then you had contributions from uh, people like the Knight of Glen, who has done so much here for the, Desmond you Fitzgerald. know, for Desmond Fitzgerald, and he represented of the great Geraldine family, um, both in Munster and Leinster. And you had people lower, like Lord Longford, who no longer uses his title, which is interesting enough and would be very much into the pure sense, if you like, of the Republican mode, because his family came in the Cromwellian times, and like it or not, that's where a lot of, of the Republican aspects of this country developed from, which is a kind of a, an incongruous thing in history. One always thinks of the Cromwellians with a certain, mm. or views them with a very jaundiced eye, but in effect many of the planters that came during that time contributed significantly to the development of Ireland. But Anne, isn't it, isn't it fascinating that, that the, the the ideologies and the philosophies of Irish nationalism and Irish republicanism were actually developed by the elite because they had the education Absolutely. to devise them in the first place. Absolutely. And, it, yeah. and in fact, they almost mm. turned on their own class yeah. to do that. And yeah. now they've, they've been, as you said, you, you describe them as a missing strata of Irish society. Yes, I mean, I'm not, I'm not pro or against, you know, I was the honest broker, hopefully, in this book, and I was the link, really, between us and them. And what I'm looking for, or was looking for in the book, to give them a vehicle. They've never been asked anything. They've never been invited to do anything. M many of them want to contribute and have contributed uh, in a very, very uh, distinct way to this country. And they really feel their sense of Irishness. But as well as that, I had to say to them, well, maybe you kept your head below the parapet. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should, like Henry Mount Charles, <coughs> come out from behind your castle walls, crumbling though they may be, mm. and be more, more upfront, really, in contributing and wishing to contribute. Why? You know, for example, in, in Japan, the great samurai families, the great mm. lords, became captains of industry. Mm. I mean, the, the head of the Mitsubishi clan became the head of Absolutely. Mitsubishi Industries. Mm -hmm. and, and in the UK, the aristocracy basically went into, into politics and mm -hmm. retained power that way. Mm -hmm. Why did the ruling class here not follow a similar path? Because after the foundation of the state, we really pushed them aside and we really didn't know what to do with them. It was as simple as that. They were thrown back to another ascendancy that we didn't want. Now the Anglo-Irish had gone and the Irish Ireland was formed. And I examined Ireland as a republic, not with Britain, where one would expect an aristocracy, but with the other republics in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the book, to see how they fared. And there was France that chopped off the heads of 8,000 of them in the French Revolution. Today in France, the aristocracy have trebled in numbers. They're in government, they're in the army, they're in finance, they're in industry. They're even in the unions, heading up the unions. Whereas we have pushed ours aside, left them there, and really don't still, I think, know what to do with it, them. Were we patronizing to refer to them as the relics of old decency? <laughs> yes, well, they are that too. Fascinating read. It is, absolutely. Um, at arm's length, Aristocrats in the Republic of Ireland in good bookshops now. Thanks and indeed. And see Grainne Whale still in the bestsellers list? N n never out of print? Never out of print. That woman will be with you forever. I think she will, hopefully. Thanks indeed, Anne, for coming into us this morning. Now, coming up a little later in the show, we'll be having...